Hi, this is an introduction to logic. I'm Mark Thorsby. This course overviews the basics of categorical, propositional, um, and predicate logic. Today in our video, we're taking a look at just basic concepts, and we'll be looking at the concepts of validity, truth, soundness, strength, and cogency. So for those of you who um, have been following along with us, welcome back. It's good to have you. Um, today we're going to be talking about the concept of validity. We're going to see that this issue of validity is really a core concept that goes uh, that we're going to be talking about throughout the entire course. In fact, much of logic, um, if not the grand majority of what we do in logic, is a test for the validity of certain sorts of arguments. So it's a pretty key concept. Um, so, but before we sort of go through and define what validity is, let's um, let's quickly remind ourselves of the distinction we made last time between two types of reasoning. Again, there are two basic forms or two types of reasoning that get employed within argumentation. So there's two types of reasoning. The first type of reasoning is deductive reasoning. And to remind you, if you didn't watch our last video, you should go watch the previous video which is on the distinction between deductive and inductive reasoning. But deductive reasoning is reasoning by necessity, reasoning by necessity. Whereas inductive reasoning, by contrast, this is reasoning by probability. So arguments that are merely probably the case, probably true, are inductive, where deductive arguments argue what has to be the case given a set of conditions. You'd say that deductive reasoning, you can have 100% certainty with your conclusions, whereas inductive reasoning, you can never be 100% certain, though um, you can be fairly well certain. So we're going to sort of see that the concepts of validity and soundness link up here with deductive reasoning, whereas strength and cogency here go along with inductive reasoning. In fact, we're going to see this, is that a deductive argument, once it's analyzed, is either going to be a valid argument or it's going to be an invalid argument. Or, and by contrast, an inductive argument is either going to be a strong argument or it's going to be a weak argument. Okay, let's start with the concept of validity. What exactly, how should we define validity? Well, since we are following along with the textbook, the Hurley textbook, take a look at how Hurley defines a valid argument. He says, quote, a valid deductive argument is an argument in which it is impossible for the conclusion to be false given that the premises are true. By contrast, an invalid deductive argument is a deductive argument in which it is possible for the conclusion to be false um, that the, given that the premises are true. Okay, so what this all goes down here to the idea is that remember, arguments should be or one of the key concepts we talked about here is the idea of the truth functionality of an argument. Truth functionality. And if an argument is truth functional, we're going to say it's a valid argument. And what that means is that if you have true premises, you can only get a true conclusion by definition. There's no other possibility. That's what a valid argument is. Such that if you if you can imagine, um, if you had a glass of water here, right, um, and you have water, right, and you imagine if you had a second or a sieve or something, right, if you pour the truth water in, truth water comes out, right? So this is what truth functionality is. If you pour truth into the premises, truth comes out in the conclusion. That's truth functionality, such that if you had true premises, you can never have a false conclusion, right? A false conclusion is, strictly speaking, an impossibility in a valid argument. Whereas an invalid argument, by contrast, you could have true premises and get out a false conclusion. Thus, it's not going to be the best sort of argument, okay? So a valid argument is one in which the truths, uh, true premises, I'll put TP here for true premises, leads to a TC, a true conclusion. Whereas an invalid argument, you can have true premises, and it's still possible, though it's not always the case, it's still possible to get a false conclusion, okay? So that's a deductive, that's what a deductive argument a valid deductive argument is. Now, one thing we'll notice here is that um, the validity of an argument is actually dependent upon the form 
of the argument. Hence, this is the linkage we're talking here about formal logic. Again, in formal logic, we analyze the form of the argument to determine validity. In fact, validity is essentially always a function of the form of an argument. What this means is that if you have a, a valid form, it is possible to have a valid argument that's not actually true. Okay, and this is where a lot of times people get confused. Uh, but I think it's going to make sense here in a minute. So let me scroll down here and show you an example here. This example comes from the Hurley textbook. This is an example of a valid argument. You're going to see why. These are the two premises. If we were going to label these, this would be premise one. In fact, let me change my color here. This is premise one, this is premise two, and this is the conclusion. Okay, all television networks are media companies. NBC is a television network, therefore NBC is a media company, okay? This is a valid argument because it's impossible for this to be false, okay? Because what this is saying is that, that all television networks, we can symbolize it by drawing a circle here, that this is the category for all television networks. Uh, I'll put this, but TVN for television networks are media companies, right? Um, and then let's draw this a bigger circle here. This is our media companies. Okay, so all television networks exist within the frame of uh, media companies. NBC is a television network, so you might just say there's a little dot here, or well, let's make an X, and that X stands for NBC. Okay, therefore NBC is a media company, right? You can see here, despite my poor drawing, I apologize for that, that this argument is going to be true because um, just by the very structure of it. In fact, if we wanted to rephrase it, it looks something like this, right? All T R M, right? That would be the first premise. The second premise here, we would say something like all N for all things that are called NBC R T television networks. Therefore, all N R M. Okay, this is a sort of bare bones re, um, rewriting of the form of the argument. This is essentially the form of the argument. And this argument is, this is always going to be a valid argument. Now, here's the difficulty though. What happens if we replace the T, the M, and the N with things that aren't correct? What if, for instance, because these are all true premises, right? Again, if we were, if we were to evaluate this, we would say that this premise is true, this premise is true, therefore this premise is true. But what happens if we replace these variables with false premises? What would happen? Would we still have a valid argument? Well, the answer, ironically and perhaps strangely, is yes. You would have a valid argument even if the premises are false. So let me give you another uh, example here. Uh, or no, 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 I'm sorry, that's an example of an invalid argument. We'll come to that in a minute. Let's, so let's sort of realign these variables. Let's see if we can do this. Uh, let's see how I can do this. So let's imagine we change these. We said all sports teams are media companies, right? And we'll say uh, Barack Obama is a sports team. Right? Therefore, right, Barack Obama is a media company. Okay? So here, here we, let's erase this thing here. Um, now here you can see that if we we're going to analyze this, uh, we have the exact same form of the argument. The form is exactly the same. Except obviously these premises are false, right? Uh, so let's take a look at it here. Let's analyze it. Right? All sports teams are media companies. That is false. That's not true. Right? Barack Obama is a sports team. That is also false. Barack Obama is the president of the United States. Therefore, Barack Obama is a media company. This is also false. So you can see here we have false premises and a false conclusion. But the form is identical. And in fact, what you're going to see, though it may be sort of hard to... Uh, to recognize this at this point in the course is that this is still a valid argument even though it's false and this is the distinction between sound and unsound arguments okay so let's scroll back up here let me sort of lay it out for you here 
So you have valid arguments. A valid argument is either sound or it is unsound. Right? What does soundness mean? A sound argument means that it has the valid form, but that the premises are actually true. Right? Um, that's what a sound argument is. What's an unsound argument? An unsound argument is an argument that has, well, an unsound, all invalid arguments are unsound. Okay? But you can have valid arguments that are also unsound. It has the right form, that we can check the form as a valid form, but it, the premises are not actually true. Because obviously, Barack Obama is not a sports team. I think that's what it was, right? Um, yeah, Barack Obama is not a sports team. Thus, the conclusion is false. So that's what we call an unsound argument. So a valid argument has the right form, and a sound argument has the right form, and it's actually true. Okay? So that's the difference between sound and unsound, and soundness and validity. Soundness means actually true premises, and validity means that it has the right form such that if the premises are true, the conclusion always has to be true. So let me give you an example here of an invalid argument. I'll scroll down here because I had another example. This is an invalid argument, and we can know it's invalid here. And ignore the question of soundness for a moment. Okay, all banks are financial institutions. Wells Fargo is a financial institution. Therefore, Wells Fargo is a bank. Now, at the face of it, take a look at it. This premise is true. This premise is true. It's true that Wells Fargo is a financial institution, and Wells Fargo is bank. This is the conclusion is actually true. So, at the face of it, if you just heard this argument fairly quickly, say, for instance, you're talking to someone and they gave you this argument, you'd think, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But in order to determine whether or not it's valid, you can't just look and see that it has true premises and a true conclusion. You have to t ask the question, is it possible for the conclusion to be false? Is it possible for this conclusion to be false? Now, if you think about it long and hard, and maybe if you want to pause this video and try to figure this out, is it possible for this to be false? Well, the quickest way to figure out whether or not the, this argument could be invalid is to symbolize it again. So if we're going to symbolize it, what, will we, what would it look like? Okay, this would be something like all B or F, okay, all things called Wells Fargo are F, therefore all things called Wells Fargo are B. Okay, this is the form of the argument actually. But think about it for a moment. All banks are financial institutions. Wells Fargo is a financial institution. Therefore, Wells Fargo is a bank. Does that really make sense? Right? And you can imagine here, what if we put different, uh, what if we put different variables here such that we had true premises? Is it possible to come up with a false conclusion? Because that's what invalidity is. Invalidity, again, is having true premises and a false conclusion. And the answer is yes, it is. Think about it for a minute. Let's draw our sort of circles here, our, our sort of proto Venns, right? Uh, so let's imagine that we have a circle here, and this circle represents banks. All banks are financial institutions, so the bigger circle here is F. Wells Fargo is a financial institution, so we put the X out here in this. Therefore, Wells Fargo is a bank. Well, wait a second. Not necessarily, right? What if Wells Fargo is a financial institution that's not a bank? Because financial institutions, there's more types of financial institutions than banks. Imagine, for instance, if you had a financial institution that was merely, let's say, an accounting firm, right? Uh, or right, an accounting firm where companies hire consultants from this firm, right, in order to do their, uh, to check up on their accounts and make sure they're paying their taxes and that sort of thing, they would be count as a financial institution but not a bank. So you can see here, if what if Wells Fargo was something like an accounting firm, this argument would fail, in fact, because it would be possible for the conclusion to be false, right? In fact, let's just imagine, let's just change the scenario. Let's just change some of the variables here. Um, and we'll just use our same example here. All banks are financial institutions. 
accounting firms are financial institutions therefore accounting firms are banks okay so you can see here I kept the form of the argument the same but I just changed out the variables here but you can see now what happens if I look at this right well here's what I see is all banks are financial institutions that premise let me see where's my pen here um, all financial institutions all banks are financial institutions that premise is true accounting firms are financial institutions that premise is true therefore accounting firms are banks that's false that is false that is not the case right so you can see here this argument is actually invalid it is invalid because due to the form of the argument it is indeed possible that the conclusion could be false even though you have true premises right and notice here that in the very first version of the argument you had a true conclusion too but it was still false now since it's invalid it's automatically unsound as well right it's an unsound argument because um, you can think unsoundness soundness here refers to something almost like the soundness of architecture right it's not a it's not a, a structure you can trust right so it's unsound in that sense so that's an example here of um, that's an example here of an invalid argument okay now take a look here at Hurley's textbook here um, <coughs> and, uh, and I drew those conclusions from it right now take a look here in fact let me just for the sake of explanation let me take this and sort of highlight it for you okay so here's what we have here is here's here's the possibilities for deductive arguments you have valid deductive and invalid deductive arguments right it is possible for a valid arguments to have true premises and a true conclusion right that's what a sound argument is right it is not possible there is no possibility for a valid argument to have true premises and a false conclusion. It is possible for a valid argument to have false premises and a true conclusion. That's unsound, though, right? Because soundness means that everything is true, right? So there's only one case of soundness here. Is it possible for a valid argument to have false premises and a false conclusion? Yes, but again, that's an unsound argument, okay? But on by contrast, take a look here at invalidity. Right? It is possible to have invalid arguments that have true premises and a true conclusion, true premises and a false conclusion, false premises and a true conclusion, false premises and a false conclusion. In fact, you can see here that there are many more possibilities for invalid arguments than there are actually for valid and sound arguments. Now, what's the goal when we actually reason? Because think, the goal of logic is to sort through all of the stuff that people are trying to convince us to believe. The goal is always to look for sound, valid arguments. And, and by contrast, to only listen to those arguments and to only make sound and valid arguments when we're trying to convince others to agree with us. Okay? Uh, but you can see here that there's only really one domain out of all of these possibilities that we want to steer towards. The grand majority of all arguments are actually either invalid or unsound. Okay, and what and what what I want you to think through is as you go through this, um, through this series of videos, and you learn logic, is I want you to become increasingly attuned to the idea, to listening and hearing and evaluating the arguments that you're actually confronted with. Let me give you an example here. Okay, um, here I'll just give you an example here. Let me open up a new tab here. I'm just going to go to YouTube. Okay. If we go to YouTube here and let's type in a valid argument, okay, a valid argument, right? And there's all, who knows what that is. Um, but here's a valid argument. There's a whole bunch of people, a lot of stuff here, a lot of logicians trying to explain, and even comedians, it looks like, talking about valid arguments. But as I scroll down, even Barack Obama is making valid arguments, it looks like. Uh, but oh, boom, what is this? It says there are no valid arguments against gay marriage right he says quote 
uh, whoever posted this, uh, my old teacher, my old reteacher, five months ago said, quote, it is my belief that there are no universally valid arguments against gay marriage. Those who oppose gay marriage often do so from a blah, 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 blah. Now, from the very title, ask yourself, is this true? Is it true that there are no valid arguments against gay marriage? Well, hopefully after this video and knowing a little bit about what a valid argument is, a valid argument depends upon the form of the argument, right? And you can indeed make a valid argument, or at least make an argument that has the correct form against gay marriage. So actually, this is a good example of this person doesn't understand what a valid argument is. Okay, they probably mean there are no sound arguments against gay marriage. Um, and maybe we're just quibbling here. I don't, I've never seen this person's video, so I don't know what they think here. And I'm not against gay marriage. So I, I probably, in a certain sense, maybe agree with this person. But I can't think, but here we should see that this sort of statement is actually not true. And we shouldn't actually believe it to be true. Though, for instance, we could be sympathetic with their perspective. Okay, so this, this is just a good example here is that I just want to show you here that you shouldn't even trust everything on um, YouTube, right, here. Because here you have an example, the very title is wrong, right? Because I can make a valid argument against gay marriage, even though I'm for gay marriage, right? Simply by arguing, for instance, saying that um, all, well, you can imagine, all I have to do is take this, if I wanted to make an argument against gay marriage that was valid, all I have to do is go up here and use this argument form, right? All I'd have to do is use this argument form and replace the variables, right? That talk about gay marriage and stuff like this. You could say something like this. All persons, um, all gay marriages are things that end in divorce, right? All persons who get... Um, uh, I don't know, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but you can imagine if you replace the variables in such a way, you can end up with a valid argument that's against gay marriage. Of course, the question is, is it sound, right? Maybe some of you in the YouTube videos, if you want, you can post an example here of a valid argument against gay marriage, or and maybe also post a valid argument for gay marriage, um, because there are valid arguments in both cases. Um, and there are, of course, many unsound, invalid arguments on both sides of that debate as well. Okay, so this is the difference between validity and invalidity, soundness and unsoundness. Valid arguments have true premises, true conclusions, and if they're sound, they really are true, right? A valid argument has the right form, but the, the premises or the conclusion itself, I'm sorry, the premises are somehow false. So that would make it unsound. Invalid arguments are always sound. So that's what, and that only counts, we only talk about validity and invalidity when we talk about deductive arguments. Now, Conversely, or at least um, in lockstep with this sort of the case here, let's talk about inductive arguments. An inductive argument is an argument by probability, right? Which means that it's probably the case. The only way you can know that an inductive argument is strong or weak is to understand what probably is the case. And you can't look to the form to know that. You actually have to look to the content. Now, in some cases, you'll see that certain forms of arguments are better than others, but in general, you have to look to the content rather than the form. A strong argument is one in which the true premises, uh, they, if you have true premises, it's, pro it's highly likely, it's probably the case that you also have a true conclusion, right? Whereas a weak inductive argument is one in which, if you have true premises, it is not here, I'll put an X here. It is not likely that you will have a true conclusion. Okay, it, so here you have high likelihood. And here you have a low likelihood. Now, one of the things to recognize here is that a weak inductive argument, because it's based upon likelihood and probability, could actually be a good argument. It could actually be true. Right? Whereas a strong argument is likely to be true, but not necessarily. So he, over here, with deductive arguments, you have 100% certainty, at least when you talk about valid sound arguments. But over here, you only have, you always have, um, let's say, less than 100% certainty. You can never be totally certain with an inductive argument because it's based on probability. Right? In fact, let's take a look here at how 
Um, let's see, where is it? Oh, it's right here. Let's take a look here at how Hurley defines uh, there is Hurley's definition for sound and, and unsound arguments, but let's take a look at what he says about strong and weak inductive arguments. Quote, he says, a strong inductive argument is an inductive argument in which it is improbable that the conclusion be false given that the premises are true. And by contrast, a weak inductive argument is an argument in which the conclusion does not follow probably from the premises even though it's claimed to, okay? just like we just defined it, okay? So let's go back down here. So inductive arguments, just because that got a little messy, right? An inductive argument is either going to be strong or weak, right? Now, a strong argument, if it really is true, right, then it's a cogent argument. So a strong argument can either be cogent or uncogent. Right? A cogent argument simply means that it is actually true. It's actually true. Whereas an uncogent argument, it obviously doesn't, isn't necessarily actually true. Weak arguments are by definition uncogent arguments. Okay? Uh, so the, you can see here we have the exact same structural feature of validity, invalidity, uh, soundness and unsoundness, except when we talk about inductive arguments, we use a different language to be precise um, because it's only based on probability. We talk about strong, weak, cogent, uncogent, right, or actually true. So let me give you some of the examples from the Hurley text here. Uh, let's see where are we? From the Hurley text of some cogent and uncogent um, strong arguments. So let's take a look at here. And when we talked about the difference, well, let's just go with this one. All dinosaur, but all dinosaur bones discovered to this day have been at least 50 million years old. Therefore, probably the next dinosaur bone to be found will be at least 50 million years old. So ask yourself, is this a strong or is this a weak argument? Well, take a look at this. Because of the regularity of every dinosaur bone we've discovered thus far is 50 million years old, that regularity gives it a high likelihood or a high probability the, the future dinosaur bones will fall within that time range of age. Thus, we would say this is a strong argument. This is a strong argument. Let's take another example here. All meteors found to this day have contained salt. Therefore, probably the next meteorite to be found will contain salt. This is another example that I think, uh, well, let's, for, well, okay, let's see what he says, right? On the face of it, this looks like a strong argument, but all meteorites found in this day have contained salt. He says the premise of this argument is clearly false. But if we assume it true, then we naturally expect the next meteorite to contain salt. Thus, the argument is strong. So this argument is strong, but it is uncogent. Okay? This is a strong argument that's uncogent because it's not actually true. Okay? Uh, so that's. I want you to just get a sense here of this differentiation here. Here's another example here. Uh, Don Perignon Champagne, which is made in France, sells over $100 per bottle. Marquis de uh, La Tour is also a French Champagne, therefore probably it too sells for over $100 per bottle. Now, uh, is this a strong or a weak argument? Um, I think it's actually a weak argument. Why? Because uh, Don Perignon Champagne is a very expensive champagne, but we know that not all champagnes are very expensive, right? If you've ever been to a cheap wedding, you know that's the case. Um, so just because a uh, champagne is made in France doesn't mean that it's expensive. So this is, uh, this is, even though this sort of has the same sort of language as a strong argument, it's actually a weak argument. Since it's weak, we would say it's also uncogent, okay? So this is the, the basic differentiation here. And you can see here that many... Let's go back here to this sort of example here that it's very similar to when we looked at um, valid arguments. Whoops, that's new. Table 1.2 for inductive arguments. Take a look at this. Okay. You can see here the same thing exists. Now, here we have strong arguments and weak arguments. You can see here that we, there's only one category of cogent and strong arguments. That's where you have true premises and a probably true conclusion. Do you have a true premises and a probably false conclusion? Well, none of those exist because that, by definition, is a weak argument.
Is it possible to have a strong argument that has false premises and a probably true conclusion? Yes, it is, but that's an uncogent argument. Is it possible to have a strong argument that is false premises and a probably false conclusion? Yes, because of the, the sake of probability, that would also be an uncogent argument. Now, weak arguments are all uncogent by definition, right? So they're all uncogent. I don't know how that actually helps explain anything, so sorry. Uh, but you can see here that, and these are great examples he gives here of all examples, and I'm not going to read them to you because you can read them on your own, right? But these are all, all, you can have weak arguments that have true premises and a probably true conclusion. That seems sort of odd, but it is in fact possible, okay? Because the conclusion could probably be true for other reasons. Take a look at his example. A few U.S. presidents were lawyers, therefore probably the next U.S. president will be older than 40. Okay, now you can see here that the premise here and the conclusion don't relate, right? These are um, not related. Since they're not related, it's a weak argument, even though this premise is true and this is actually probably a true conclusion, since the grand majority of all presidents have been over 40. In fact, maybe all of them, I actually don't know off the top of my head, but probably all of them. I know you have to be 35 to be the president, but all of them that I can think of have been over 40. Right. So notice that you can actually have true premises, probably true conclusion. The question is whether or not the premises actually provide support or evidence for the conclusion being probably the case. OK. Uh, and you can see here you can have uncogent arguments in all these other domains. OK. So this is an example here. I hope this makes sense. I, I know maybe we've labored a bit long here on the difference of all this stuff. Um, and you can take a look at the book here where he gives this he gives examples of all of this stuff. So real quick, just as a quick overview here. Um, actually, no, whoops. Right, so take a look at this. You can see here that what have we discussed so far in um, our logic course is that there are statements. A statement can either be true or false. Right, in fact, let me... So you can have statements. A statement is either true or false. This is known as the principle of bivalence, right? In a group of statement, it can either be an argument or a non-argument. Arguments are either deductive or inductive. And then out of deductive arguments, they're either valid or invalid. Invalid or all unsound. And if they're valid, they're either sound or unsound. And inductive arguments are either strong or weak, cogent or uncogent. You can see here what I kind of, though I think that this could be sort of made to look a little bit clear here, what we're building up here is really sort of a stratification for evaluating arguments. And this is why this is really key and critical here to the basic understanding of the whole structure of logical arguments. Now in these exercises, these are actually, exercises are actually really fun because you're going to see is that the first section here, there are deductive arguments and you have to determine whether or not they're valid or invalid. And the majority here, I think, are actually from real um, things. And then the next year he's going to give you inductive arguments and you have to figure out whether they're strong or weak. Okay. And then here you have to determine whether or not uh, the argument, you have to evaluate the argument totally, right? Determine whether the following arguments are inductive or deductive. And then if they're deductive or inductive, figure out if they're strong, weak, valid, or invalid. And then finally, the last one here is it's going to ask you to define terms and sort of evaluate these. It's actually a really fun sort of series of exercises to do. And it's really good practice because ultimately, and remember, this may seem sort of dry and boring, but uh, it's really fun. It's really important, rather, because the because um, as you get better and better with these arguments, you'll be able to actually be able to determine whether or not the arguments you hear in your ordinary life are valid or invalid, deductive or inductive, okay? In our next video here, we're going to be taking a look at argument forms and how we can prove invalidity, okay? Because obviously, invalid arguments you want to avoid, how can we prove those, okay? So that's our next video. I'll see you then. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, bye.